celebrating 30 years of discovery, the Hubble telescope turns 30. As the pandemic continues, people are anxious to get back to their normal lives. But how will that work? And what does it mean to have the coronavirus? Hello, Blood. I'm Lucas Consuegra, and welcome to this episode of WBLN News. Today marks the 30 year anniversary of when the Hubble telescope was launched and began taking amazing images of our universe. Enrique Sori has a story. April 24th marks the 30th anniversary of the Hubble telescope. Hubble's unique design, which allows it to be repaired and upgraded with the advanced technology by astronauts, has made it one of NASA's longest living and most valuable observatories beaming transformational astronomical images to Earth for decades. Hubble has fundamentally changed our understanding of the cosmos. Throughout the year, NASA will be celebrating how the Hubble has brought the universe home to Earth, with special events on social media, posting new images, videos, documentaries, and more. I was able to speak with James Geletic, Deputy Project Manager for Hubble. Hubble has taken over 1.4 million observations of the universe today. And those Observations have been used to produce over 17,000 peer-reviewed scientific papers on its discoveries. And those papers have been referenced in other papers an amazing 900,000 times. So Hubble is the most productive spacecraft in terms of the volume of scientific return of any spacecraft ever built by NASA. And many people have argued it's the most productive scientific instrument ever built by humankind. So because Hubble's up there, it can see multi-wavelengths across all kinds of wavelengths of light, ultraviolet, visible, and infrared at higher resolutions than you get from the ground. So therefore, you can make these discoveries that you can't from ground-based observatories. So that's one of the reasons it was most significant. We're hopeful that we can keep Hubble making the groundbreaking discoveries that it's making today into the late 2020s or even beyond. To keep updated on all of NASA's Hubble's anniversary activities as they develop, be sure to follow them on social media and use the hashtag Hubble30. Reporting for WBLN, I'm Enrique Sori. Thank you, Enrique. As we continue to be quarantined and practice social distance, many people wonder when and how the city and the country will reopen. Agent Ponce has more. With the country battling and trying to stop the spread of COVID-19, State governments are trying to find ways to return to normal at the same time as precautioning to fight the virus. We have, and it's, a, it's similar to the president's plan, it's a three-phase plan. Each phase has uh, 14 days in it, assuming, of course, that the data continues to show a decline in new cases. Uh, our first phase requires three data points. One of them is new cases. The other one is, uh, you know, or actually reduction in new cases for 14 consecutive days, a reduction in symptomatic reporting, which is different people reporting symptoms as opposed to new cases in 14 days, and also a stabilization of hospital census. We think that the, um, we think that we're essentially there, but we want a certification from the state of Florida because the state of Florida, number one, has the expert epidemiologists. And number two, they're the data aggregators or the data collectors. And so we want a certification, A, from the experts and B, from those who are collecting the data, that we've reached phase one before we begin uh, the process of opening in a very limited and selective fashion different aspects of our society. Florida, for one, has already begun trying to return to normal by reopening their beaches, but residents are hesitant to return. That is the quintessential question. And the biggest fear that I have is, A, right now our unemployment benefits are not getting to the people that need it. So you have a million and a half people that have applied for unemployment in the state of Florida and only 40,000 that have received it, which means that that $850 a week check, which is significant, is not getting to the people that need it. And so what happens is you have a pressure to open based on economic factors as opposed to based on medical factors. And so the concern that I have is if we open up too quickly, we can have a second wave, which would require us to close again. That would be disastrous for our economy. Um, at the same time, because people are not getting the unemployment benefits, because uh, government has taken too long uh, to help people, uh, the concern I have is that you know May is May first is right around the corner. People have to pay rent, 
and and they're literally struggling to, to be able to eat. And so that is a concern that I have uh, on taking too long. So it's there is no right answer. We're, we're, we're trying to take all the medical advice and all the information that we can to make the best decision. For WBLN News, I'm Adrian Bolton. Thank you, Adrian. While the cases of the coronavirus began to level off, there have been over 10,000 cases in Miami alone. But what does it mean to have the virus and to get it over with? Jose Cobiela tells us more. Coronavirus has been spreading all over the country, leaving people to have to quarantine in their homes and wait it out. The virus, which has forced schools and many public areas to lock down, is still mysterious to many. So, so this thing replicates in your respiratory tract. And, it, and in some people, it starts working its way down into your respiratory tract, into your, low, into your lower respiratory tract, and can cause pneumonia and a lot of inflammation in your lungs. That's one of the things, like a typical virus, it's an, you know, an infecting agent, and it, and it promotes a lot of uh, immune response from our own body. So we get things like, like fever, uh, headaches, and, and other symptoms. Like some other respiratory viruses, this one also does work its way into our intestines or some groups of individuals do pick up a little bit of intestinal complaints, diarrhea. And one of the most common symptoms of it that people get is a, in a to smell or taste. And that's one of our, one of our um, questions that we asked early on in the disease because that, that seems to pick up a large group of patients. So it's, it's a symptom that most commonly is found in early infection. Coronavirus oftentimes hits out of nowhere. The symptoms build up over days and can often last for weeks. I up on March 24th around 2 a.m. and I had the chills. Um, I got very nervous because on March 13th, I had flown from Chicago to Syracuse, New York to pick up um, my son, who's a Belen class of 2019 graduate from Cornell University. And um, I had not been feeling sick at all. I had no symptoms and it was about 10 days from that last flight. and. Uh, uh, around 7 a.m. took my temperature and I was running 100.5 degree fever and then looked up at the, the mild symptoms and you know it, it the fever was right in the range of what they described as mild symptoms then around uh, 10 o'clock started ha getting uh, headaches started getting a slight cough and it was at that point speaking with my wife that I ran to um, Northwestern Medical Center where they were doing walk-up testing and drive-up testing. And I met all the preliminary uh, requirements to get tested. The world has been completely changed due to coronavirus. People's lives have been dramatically altered and we still don't know everything about this virus. Only time will tell what comes next. With WBLN, I'm Jose Cobia signing out. I'm Adrian Rodriguez with your sports news for Friday, April 24th. In basketball, a new documentary was released last Sunday centered around Michael Jordan and the Chicago Bulls' 97-98 season. The docuseries has already become a nationwide hit and will air two new episodes every Sunday. Now on to the NFL. Earlier this week, the NFL was shaken up by Rob Gronkowski's surprise return from retirement. He came out of retirement as part of a trade deal that sent him to Tampa Bay to reunite with Tom Brady, his former all-star teammate. Along with that major acquisition, many teams got the opportunity to bolster their rosters last night with the beginning of the NFL Draft. This draft is the first to be done completely virtually due to the current coronavirus pandemic. Doing the draft this way is a new experience for all of us, but some things remain the same. First, the hugs. Sharing that special moment with a player when he is selected is a big highlight for me. My body won't miss those great big bear hugs but I sure will. Instead, we'll find other ways to have fun virtually. Second, I will miss the interaction I have with our fans over these three days. It's a draft tradition and one that I genuinely enjoy. As expected, the Miami Dolphins completed their tank for two a season by selecting him with the fifth overall pick. This has been a dream growing up. My entire life working hard um, tirelessly with my father and the support that um, I, I had with my mom as well in this. The two following picks for the Dolphins had them choosing Austin Jackson, offensive tackle, University of South California, and Noah Igbenogny, cornerback from Auburn. 
The draft will continue tonight at 7 and tomorrow at 12. That's all for sports. Thank you, Adrian. That's our show for today. Remember to check in next week for our new episode. Be sure to follow us on YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Stay safe, stay home, stay golden, Wolverines.